I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology. Uh, and uh, uh, I am very happy uh, uh, to be a part of this event today. And I would like to uh, uh, welcome and uh, 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 say how much it is an honor and privilege for uh, us to have our guest Sandra Oviringi Mana uh, uh, here at the University of Tennessee Knoxville uh, to be a part of this event uh, that is supported by the UT, uh, uh, University of Tennessee Knoxville Center for Global Engagement. Oviringi Mana's book, How Dare the Sun Rise, and I have a copy right here, an account of her experiences as a 10-year-old survivor of a massacre in a refugee camp in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, and the painful remaking of life for herself and her surviving family members, eventually in the United States, won praise from reviewers for its powerful and compassionate prose, but also for its nuanced and personal account of how refugees don't simply suffer, but actually act upon their world as well, as they struggle to survive and remake their lives. The New York Times Review of Books describes How Dare the Sun Rise as a gut-wrenching poetic memoir that reminds us that no life story can be reduced to the word refugee. Uviringiamana weaves the pieces of her life into a fine tapestry that evokes deep empathy. Booklist, another reviewer, <clears throat> goes further, reminding us why Uviringiamana's work is so important in our present historical moment. Quote, as America's doors threaten to shut down, sh shut against refugees, this memoir could not be more timely. Her ability to summon the chaos and terror is extraordinary, but then so is she. Uviringi Mana has emerged as a powerful spokesperson for the plight of the dispossessed. In addition to being a passionate public advocate for the rights of displaced and dispossessed people in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and beyond, Uberingi Mana is also the co-founder of the Jimbere Fund, a nonprofit that works to empower rural women in the DRC. Please join me in extending a warm welcome to Sandra Uberingi Mana, Senior. Thank you. Um, I, hello everybody. Um, I am Dr. Tamar Sharinian. Um, I am a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of uh, Anthropology at UTK, and I have the pleasure of asking the first question. Um, Sandra, thank you for being here today and for speaking with us. I'm really excited about this event. Um, I want to start with where you start your book. You write that you were a happy kid and that you have joyful memories of your childhood, but you also write that, quote, you knew the sounds of war before you knew how to do a cartwheel. Can you speak a little bit about that war and give our audience a sense of what was going on and what is unfortunately still going on? How did war impact your childhood in your life? Hi, everyone. I just want to say quickly how grateful I am to be a part of this conversation. And I just want to thank the organizers and moderators for having me here today. And when I talk about being a happy kid, it's really who I was. I was a kid and I was really happy. Although war was going on in the background of my life, it was still a very joyful life, one full of celebrations, full of accomplishment. Um, I remember one of my earliest childhood memories was just going to school, coming back, and, and my parents, my dad had this little old red Toyota that he would pick us up in, and, and that was kind of life. That's what I looked forward to, is going to school and, and playing with my friends and getting back home and, and, and then being with my friends in my neighborhood. It was never, I never felt like I was a kid that was living in a war-torn country as everyone likes to call, to call me. So it was quite a surprise to me to hear that I lived in one of the poorest and worst countries in the world. Because to me, although I knew the realities of war at a young age, I also knew the kind of joy and love that comes from being a Congolese child. 
um, and just the luxury of being a child there. Like I really look back with such fondness to uh, at my life there because I never, I really felt like a kid. I felt like I got to live my life as a child. Um, people tend to think that because there is a war that life stops in that you're constantly in this fleeing mode or um or that you're constantly in hiding and that there there is no joy there's no celebration and that's simply not true you know they they militias would fight and rebel groups would fight and men would go off to war and young boys would be kidnapped into wars but um at the end of the day if you if the war was not like literally right there life went on because life had to uh, life doesn't stop just because there's a war in your country uh, you still have to go to school you still have to find food to feed your children you still have you still have to carry on people get married they start families so there was a lot of joy there is a lot to celebrate um, even in the midst of what most people would say would call a war torn um, or unstable. Yes, it was unstable, of course. I, I had most of my early um, schooling interrupted. Every year would be interrupted by some war that I had no part in, that I, I didn't know what the cause was. Um, no one, no one, really, we didn't know. As children, we didn't know what the war was about, but we knew that we had to be the first people to escape because we were minorities. Um, and just to kind of give some context, so I'm from the Banyamulenge tribe, which is a minority tribe in, in Congo. And we've been discriminated against basically since I can remember. My mom likes to say that when she was a little girl, she grew up fleeing on her mom's back and she grew up fleeing with us on her back. And, and so it's all that we've known for generations. It's one of those things that you get so used to that at the age of six, I knew like by the look of my dad's face, the look in his eye, I would know that it was time to leave the country. I would know that it was unsafe. As hard as he tried to shield all of us from what was happening, we would just know. They, they, there would be that thing in his eye when he came home from work that would just tell us that we were unsafe and that soon we would need to either stay in hiding or leave the country, which we had to do multiple times. By the time I was 10 years old, I had already left my country several, several times to go to Burundi just so the war can calm down. Um, it would happen for like sometimes weeks, sometimes months where the rebels are fighting until they run out of um, resources and then retreat. And then it would be kind of safe for a while and people would come back. And so we got used to that life. We almost adapted to it. So uh, while I was gone, I would always have like, you know, my studies to think about because some of the kids that got to stay in the country that weren't minorities, that weren't the targets would stay in school. School didn't stop just because a few minority kids were gone. Um, so I got used to that as well. I got used to coming back and having to catch up to, to my schooling, which I, I never minded. I felt really lucky to even have schooling because it, at that time, it was very, you know, it was a privilege to go to school, to go to a good school at that. And my parents worked really hard to provide me with good schooling. Um, so I, I feel like I, I was raised kind of always looking at the positive and how much worse things could be. And so I never really felt like all of these terms that I don't really like to like call myself like oh like war torn poor um i i didn't i didn't feel like that even though some days we didn't have food to eat i i felt very rich because i had so much more than 
the average person around me. I had school, I had a family that loved me. My dad had a job, my mom had multiple um, businesses that she was working on. So I, I, I really felt privileged and, and my parents made sure to remind me of that. And that's why I kind of say that I was a happy child, even though I'm talking about war, I'm talking about displacement. Because in the midst of that, I got to be a child. I got to really explore my imagination um, because we didn't have much. We really had to think outside the box on how to play and entertain ourselves uh, as children. And I look back at it and I, I say, thank you for making that my childhood because I don't think I would have had such an imaginative, such a fun childhood if not for the circumstances that I, I, I was in. And that's not to say that I wouldn't have liked being like maybe a rich kid somewhere in the West and, you know, not have war or anything. I'm sure I, I would have loved that. But um, I really don't look at my upbringing as just war because that's not all that it was. Um, there was war, but there was also just normal everyday life. Thank you, Sandra. Um, I want to I want to turn to something uh, uh, slightly kind of a, 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 I, I guess moving to a kind of trying to connect us here in the United States to what has been happening in the Democratic Republic of the Congo and in Africa in general. Most Americans know that there's a lot of violence and war in Africa, and of course we you know see this in the news a lot. We hear a lot being said about this, and we assume that there are. You know, these are happening in places that are so far removed and so unconnected to our own worlds. But we also now know a little more about all of this, right? And we know that there's so much of what the Congolese and other African people produce uh, and, and make is actually vital to our world. Our world, I speak of today in the world of cell phones and electronic devices. Congo, of course, produces some of the critical minerals that are necessary for these, 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 these the very things that we use. In fact, to even have this event right now. But instead of being a mineral superpower, the Democratic Republic of the Congo remains torn apart by war and violence, and it ranks very low on the global human development indicators. So what kind of role do you think, uh, uh, in your view, do minerals and resources and the Western and other corporations that are mining parts of the Congo where all of this is happening, what role do they have to play in all of this? And I have a related question to that, Sandra. Um, and that has to do with the fact that, you know, in, in America, we kind of like to look at what is happening in faraway places and say, you know, this is so unfortunate. But then many Americans like to think that Africa has these kinds of re repeated events, these horrible kinds of wars and conflicts, because Africans lack democracy, or that they engage constantly in tribal warfare. How would you respond to somebody who says that Africans don't want democracy and that's why they always have war? Sorry, that was a very long question. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. It's a great question. I think that, funny enough, growing up, I, I knew that Congo was rich. I knew we had all these minerals. Um, they taught us that in school, but I never saw them. I never saw where all these conflicts were happening. Uh, I didn't know what was the big deal. And if we are so rich, how come everyone around me is poor? And those were kinds of the questions that I asked myself as a child. Um, and it wasn't until I grew up and, and really learned what that meant that I was like, wow, this is really some messed up stuff because we're literally sitting on gold mines, yet we're thought of as this like, very poor country, which makes no sense when you think about it. So of course, like, there are outside factors and, and that being just outside companies, Western companies, Chinese companies, Russian companies, that know exactly the value of Congolese land, Congo's land, um, and harvest it. And in order to harvest it, you, you need a government that kind of allows you to do that. And thankfully for them, our government has been very corrupt for many years. Um, we have leaders that aren't really interested in looking out for the average Congolese person rather than like filling up their own pockets. And we, we grew up knowing that. 
Um, but when I became an adult and started traveling Congo and, and even with my work now with the nonprofit and really seeing people working in these mines was so eye-opening. Because once you see a person working literally in a gold, gold mine every day, but they go home to a house that has no electricity, a house that doesn't like have food, your children are not in school, and you work in a gold mine, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Every day they work in gold mines, but they're not able to put their child in the most basic, basic education. Um, and you start to wonder, why is that? It can't be. Like, why is that? Gold, you know, people buy gold. It, it's a commodity. People buy all these minerals. They say that they run cell phones and electric cars, all these things that sustain Western economies. So how come that the people that work in there are not even self-sustaining, let alone rich, but just self-sustaining? Um, and the more you learn, is more, is, the more you, you find that there are outside factors that really benefit from the instability in Congo. And you start to think, wow, well, how do these rebel groups who also are just everyday Congolese people that don't have much, how do they get all this armor? How do they get all these weapons to fight one another? There are people financing um, wars unfortunately, uh, causing instability in my country, just in order to gain access to the very riches. It feels like sometimes like it's a curse. The Congo has been, been given this curse of wealth that no Congolese person, no average Congolese person can access, but it is powering the rest of the world. And that just made me angry as a young adult, it made me absolutely furious to, to think that um, we were kind of being used as these pawns um, for wars that we had no hand in creating. But when people write about them, they say that we are savages. They say that we can't get along. They say that it's because of tribalism and we hate one another. And that's simply not true. Um, because I truly believe that Congolese people are some of the friendliest and anyone on the continent of Africa that has interacted with Congolese people would attest to this. They are very friendly, very outgoing, just kind people who sees life. Um, I, although I experienced a lot of really dark and depressing things in Congo, but the spirit of Congo in general is one full of so much joy. So I refuse to hear um, this narrative that we are just savages that can't stop fighting. When you put poverty and combine it with an abundance of resources that people can't reach, that's a problem. It's bound to cause conflict. Um, and it's actually been studied a lot that like a lot of the conflicts, especially in the Eastern Congo, they tend to spike in times where there is famine, where there's say drought and people, farmers are not growing as much crop as, crop as they thought they would have that year. And so a lot of people are hungry and they're looking for somebody to blame. But then you combine that with a lack of education in the country and people do not know that your neighbor is not the person to blame. They're not to blame for you not having enough resources, even though you're sitting in this very rich land. It's the people that are in power that are making these decisions. Um, and I, not to say that I blame, I blame the West, but I think they, they, they play a key role in, in the dis destabilization of Congo um, through our cell phones. And I'm guilty too, I use it as well. We all use it, but when we don't educate ourselves as to how this is getting made, who's actually at the front line harvesting these minerals that are so essential to the tools that we use every day, and how's their lives, we, we don't care. Like, it's not something that, that they advertise. But when you dig a little deeper and you see the billions of dollars that are being made in, by Western companies, 
um, with these cell phones or um, self-driving cars and electric cars. It's appalling. It's it's truly appalling. Well, they say, well, we got in, we bought it fair and square. It's not fair and square because you're working with corrupt regimes that are out for self-interest. And not the interests of the Congolese people, and and unfortunately, that's something that I feel like Congolese people are just now also getting educated on. We still have we used textbooks that were written by our colonizers that literally still said that they came to Congo, that the Belgians came to Congo to bring about civilization, um, which, wow, is just wow. You, you know, you have the world largest genocide of people and you're still up until like 2009 calling it civilization um and then you know those very same people can't comprehend how they're perpetuating this violence to me it's you know there there, there has to be a lot of personal and governmental responsibilities taken by a lot of the actors in Congo. Uh, it's not enough to say, well, I paid the fair price that it, it's not enough. It's simply not enough because you're going through channels that are corrupt in the first place. Um, and so because Congolese people don't know all of this because we're not as educated as we should be because we don't have any educational tools written by our own people who have our interests at heart. Many of us go through life without knowing who the true enemy is, so to say, um, who the person wish to be blaming is. So what do we do? We turn to each other. We look at the minority, as many cultures and civilizations have done for you know, hundreds of thousands of years is to blame one another. You look at your neighbor and you say, well, you're the reason I don't have enough to eat. You're the reason I'm not as, as successful as I should be. You're the reason I can't afford to send my school, my kids to school because, well, you know, you're taking all the money that should be going to my family. And like, that's not true. Um, so a lot of these issues that are now coming up in, in different movements have really, I didn't even know how they were connected to my displacement until my adulthood that I was like, wow, like maybe if people went through the proper channels, maybe if this government wasn't so corrupt and conducted business in a way that benefited Congolese people, they wouldn't have been at each other's throats. I wouldn't have had to leave my country and I would still be there. And don't get me wrong, that's not to say that I don't love all the opportunities I've been afforded in America. It just means that there's really no place like home. I know people say that and it's very cliche, but there isn't a place like home. Even here in America, after all these years, I still feel like an outsider in a lot of spaces. I still feel like there's something that I'm missing um, because this is not my birth country. And people are always labeling me as this other, the refugee. And for a long time, I felt like this charity case that America had taken on. But the more I learned, the more I was like, well, this is almost like reparations because, you know, like Western actors have contributed to a lot of this, the destabilization in my country. And probably unknowingly, intentionally or unintentionally, um, played a role in me being here. So it's a, I never wanted to be in America. I never wanted to leave my country. I don't know anybody that wants to be destabilized and be sent to a country where they don't understand or speak the language. No one wants that. Um, so I, I like to tell people that like, you know, if you don't want refugees, if you don't feel like you want people to come into your country, then you need to start paying attention to what your country is doing in those countries and how they're conducting those businesses. Because oftentimes, um, corporations outside are fueling the very violence and um, on, like the, the violence that's happening to the people that they're trying to get rid of in their own country. So people, when, when people tell me, go back to Africa, I say, I'd love to, I'd love to. 
if there was a place for me to go back to, if this violence would stop. Um, and, and the thing is, is, there are too many people that benefit from the violence, probably more people than the ones that are suffering from it. And that's the reason it's not that simple. It's very complex. It's not just about, oh, let's get people together and help them understand one another and everything will be solved. It's not that simple. It, you have outsiders that do not belong to the country that are contributing to this violence, this division. Um, and that's something I would implore everyone to do the research on because whether you know it or not, we are all a part of it um, from the way we consume, to, like where we, spend, where we spend our money in electronics and you know, in cars and many more things that you may think have nothing to do you know I didn't think oh well I'm supporting I'm supporting the the abuse of minors in Congo by buying this iPhone or buying this cell phone um but in many cases you are without knowing and I'm, I'm grateful for movements that have um been birthed out of this that really are highlighting these companies and putting pressure on them to go about their business in a right way, in a fair way, and in a way that does not lead to violence and displacement of people. Um, but you know, it, it's much. It's 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 a, a topic that's honestly very very complex. Um, that I urge everyone to do research on, and you'll be you'll be surprised at how you yourself are playing. Uh, into these situations that you thought were so far away from you that you couldn't relate to, but your very actions as a consumer are are actually a big part. Thank you so much for that kind of tying in the the context of war to our everyday lives here in the US and kind of helping us think through how what's happening over there is not just happening over there, it involves us in many ways over here. My, my next question for you is about the over here. So your, your experiences as, as a refugee in the United States, as, as a refugee from Africa in the United States. So you write in your book about the a kind of, um, in some ways, difficult childhood that you had as you came here to the United States and having to provide support in translating for your mother, having to um, struggle with poverty or watch your family struggle with poverty um, as in a refugee family um, and also being mocked at school um, for for who you were and these multiple layers of struggle can be obviously very difficult for a child um, so what would you say about some of the contemporary politics in the US today especially around um, the the limitation on the number of refugees taken into the US over the last four years um, as well as the emergence at the same time, the, the more public emergence of the Black Lives Matter movement and the dimensions of race um, in, the, in the United States. Um, what would you say about those things with, with your own experience? Yeah, so when I first came to America, rather when I first heard that I was coming to America, I thought, wow, my life is about to change. Um, when you are in Africa and you're reading about America or you're hearing about America, you hear of it as this just magical place where everyone is equal, everyone is well off, no one is poor. You don't think that there is struggle and hardship in America because that's not the image that America has abroad. And I have to say, it's very great PR on America's behalf. Um, and you'd be surprised, you know, they go all around the world saying that we have this great country and we're so amazing. And then when people show up, they're surprised. They're like, why would you want to come here, go back to your country? Well, you spent all these years telling me how great your country is. <laughs> you know, now I want to be here. I want to better my life too. But um, 
so like I grew up watching and kind of idolizing like many of my friends did, you know, American music videos. And I, you know, I had this idea that um, American life was just something that was out of this world. Like you walk on the streets and you're just showered in money. <laughs> and uh, I felt like I would get off the plane and they would give my family like cars and money and be like, you're all set, go ahead and live your life. Like that was my image. And I'm really not exaggerating because that's what we were told. And honestly, the, the classes to prepare you to um, becoming a refugee in America, I have to say, need a lot of improvement because all they told us about was how cold it was and how Americans don't like to be pointed at or stared at, which I had no plans on doing. Um, but when we got here, it was kind of a culture shock and within a culture shock because it was not what I expected. Um, yes, it was very cold, that for sure. But even my idea of cold was still like 65 degrees. <laughs> it was not, you know, snow, like blizzard happening in the middle of April. That was not my idea of cold, which is what exactly we walked into. I think, yeah, we came here on the 3rd of April and in 2007 in Rochester, New York. I don't know if you guys know Rochester, New York, but it's very cold, significantly colder than Tennessee. Um, I have no idea who decided that. They could have put me in like Arizona or Georgia or anywhere else in America that was not so cold but we were freezing and and then like in the days after we arrived and we, we start to go to the grocery store um and seeing like homeless people people that are hungry people that are begging and it took me by surprise i never thought that i would see a homeless person in america that i would see a hungry person in america i thought well, they're always in my country telling me what they can do for me. They must have everything figured out in their countries. That was my first thought is that, you know, they must have figured out everything. And they they didn't. You know, I came to learn that people are, you know, there are hungry children in America. There are kids that can't afford school the meals at school. All these things that I used to think were just African problems because we've been told for so long that there were African problems. Um, and to come to see it in a country like America that boasts about how developed it is, how civilized they are, and how you know well off they're the best in the world. Um, and to find that, that there are people that are struggling was, you know, it, it, I don't know, it, I guess maybe part of me was comforted to know that life is life no matter where you're from and you know you, you can struggle or be well off like it's all like kind of this luck that no one has control over but a part of me felt lied to I, I felt like they didn't prepare me well enough to be living in this country um but back to what you asked about um, how it felt being a refugee here. It felt like everyone was just, like everyone that helped us was just trying to feel good about themselves. Like it didn't feel, it didn't feel like we were these contributing members of society that America was excited to welcome. It felt like we were at these charity cases that they were taking on. And that's kind of the, that's the image that we had everywhere. Everyone had to, everyone was thinking of us as like these, you know, you're taking American taxpayer money, we're, you know, they're feeding us, they're buying all our clothes, they're paying for our houses, we should be so grateful. And, you know, I'm what? 12, 13, 12 going on 13 at this time, I had just lost my sister in the most brutal um, attack in just experienced some of the most horrific things in the world. And I get here and people are telling me I should be like you. They're like, oh, wow, you're so lucky. 
that was one of the comments I kept hearing over and over is that I was so lucky to be here. I did not feel lucky, not, not, not even a bit. Um, it felt like I was in a strange land where everyone wanted me to adapt, but no one really cared who I was, where I was coming from, what language I speak, what I eat, what my culture is, no one cared. But I had to care about every single thing about them because that was the only way that I could fit in. And that made me angry. It made me such an angry teenager. Um, going to school and having kids. So I had really short hair when I first arrived uh, because back at home, we don't, they don't let kids that aren't in our high school, they don't allow them to keep long hair because of just hygiene, hygiene reasons. They want all the students to shave their hair so that, you know, no kids will feel left out or if a kid can't afford to like take a shower every day that they can still feel comfortable kind of coming in and, and feeling like everyone looks the same. Everyone wears a uniform. You all kind of have this look that um, you need to have in order to be in school, which I thought was pretty great. You know, you, when you're in school, you shouldn't be thinking about who looks better than you, who's wearing the most expensive clothes and most expensive shoes. Um, but when I arrived here and, and started to go to school, it was very obvious to my classmates that I had less than they had. And so my clothes were mostly like recycled, mostly like secondhand. And I didn't speak English and, you know, kids would try to make fun of me. Thankfully, I didn't understand a word, but they would also make me like repeat things like profanities that I had no idea what they meant. Just kids being kids, you know, I, I look back at it now and think probably if they were in my country, like there would have been some kids also to do those kinds of things to them. Um, so I don't take it personally, but what I do take personally is this, this idea in in America that you are supporting refugees from your taxpayer dollars. Reality is we have to pay back everything. Um, even the plane ticket that brought us here, my parents had to work to pay it back to the US government. So there is nothing free at all. And the the money that helps refugees settle, which is usually in this country, it's usually six months to a year, depending on which state you're in. But in New York, it was it was six months of assistance, and that assistance typically typically comes from nonprofits. It doesn't come from the U.S. government. So yes, they get funding from the U.S. government, but um, mostly it comes from everyday private donors to those nonprofits and then goes on to help uh, the resettling refugees. So to people who just thought we were just freeloaders in America, after we got here, a few weeks after we got here, all my parents and siblings over the age of 18 had to get a job. It doesn't matter if they had college uh, aspirations, they had to get a job. Thankfully for me, I was underage and I could just continue school, but one of my sisters was um, 17, going on 18 when she got here, my sister Adele, and she had to fight the school board in order to go to school because they deemed her too old to go back to high school and finish and say, well, I need to finish high school in order to enroll in college. We had been living as displaced people in Rwanda for two years with no education. Well, I, I had education, but some of my siblings didn't. And so they were like, well, we just place people based on age. You have to go to, you have to get a job. And she had to fight for herself. She, even without knowing English, she understood that she really needed to get a high school diploma in order to be a valuable member of society. And that's just something that shouldn't happen. It, you shouldn't have 17 year olds being denied access to education because they need to find jobs um, fast enough. You know, like they, they wouldn't even, our social workers were just like, well, this is what our books say. If you're over 18, we need to find you a job, I'm sorry. And she was like, who do I need to speak to 
in order to find to to get into school. So she had to she had to go to jump through all sorts of hoops and actually get in front of the school board and plead her case and make them understand why it is that she's now 18 and hasn't gotten her high school diploma. She's been displaced for two years. That's why. Um, so you have all these challenges that so many people don't see, but when they see you all, they say, well, you're so lucky. You know, you're so lucky. Even after hearing our story, they say, you're so lucky. And I'll say, what part of leaving your home in these circumstances seems lucky to you? There's nothing about it. Nothing about it is lucky. Um, so you have, you have that aspect and then you have kids like me who have to grow up really quickly. When you come here uh, as a kid, it's very easy for you to pick up English. I think after three months, I was pretty conversational in English. I, I could get around, I could understand most things. My vocabulary wasn't, you know, that great, that great but like I could understand most things. I could, I could go to the grocery store and be able to translate for my mother. I could read a letter and tell her what it said generally. Um, but that became my responsibility. I had to come home every day and translate bills for my mom. Uh, I would have to be the person calling the cable company, calling the electricity company to say, well, you know, we're paying this month and that. Things that I shouldn't have had to do at 13 years old, 14 years old. Um, but those kinds of, beca those became the responsibility of our children to kind of take care of our parents who, didn't have the opportunity to go back to school and learn English. You know, like I said, many, all of them have to get jobs as soon as they arrived. Um, so it becomes this just constant, constant struggle to just stay afloat, fit in, but also don't fit in too much because you have to go home and, and play this other role of being a translator and sort of social worker to your parents. Um, and that's, those are the parts of being a refugee that a lot of people do not see and have no idea what it's like. Um, and you shouldn't, you shouldn't never ever tell a refugee that they're lucky to be here. This country is great. Uh, and I appreciate a lot of the things that I've been able to um, achieve, but I do not feel lucky because this is, I did not ask for this. I did not want to be here. If I had a choice, I would have stayed home. Um, if I had a home that was safe, I would, I would choose to be there because there's nothing like not having to explain your identity to anyone, not having anyone question your belonging. Um, not having anyone say that, oh, well, you know, that African, it, it, it just kind of became this insult, something that I used to be so proud of, it suddenly felt like an insult. Um, but also we were introduced to this concept of race that I wasn't familiar with. I grew up where everyone looked like me, everyone was black. Yes, we had tribal conflicts, but everyone looked like me no one had a different color no one could say well you're you know you're this you're that based on your color um so when i arrived here everything i saw about black people the people that looked like me on television was negative and i started to internalize that and it wasn't until much later on that i learned that not what i see on television is the reflection of the black community at large um, and just think like mid 2000s, 2010s, what you're watching local news and, you know, you're watching like just regular television and that's your only, your only resource for what it means to be black in America. It is a completely distorted, um, hateful really divisive narrative that's perpetuated. I came to believe that Black people are just these criminals. Um, and I didn't understand why all the bad things were like attributed to Black people. And even my parents would be like, well, you know, don't, don't go out. We lived, when you come here, um, you're, you're put in some of the worst neighborhoods 
in the city that you arrive in because there's a cheat test. And so my parents were all so scared for us because everything we were looking at the news and they would be like, you know, don't hang out, don't hang out with those people. And, uh, you know, I did, it was this very confusing thing because like, why shouldn't I hang out with the people that look like me? I should be, you know, I should be feeling that sense of belonging with them because I look like them. And we didn't know, we were just watching the news and thinking maybe like, black Americans are bad you know maybe they really are just so bad and of course that's not true and just coming educating myself because of course then American education is not so great in educating people about systematic racism and how it manifests in everyday society so I had to do a lot of just educating myself um, and I came to learn about how black people are perceived in this country they, because of the racism that's deeply rooted in, in the system of this country. And that's when I started to really identify with my blackness here because I felt this kinship to black people here um, because they were dealing with the very same things that I fled almost, like the discrimination the being told that you don't belong, being told that you're this criminal all the time. Um, and up from then, I really like, I took to heart that I, I was this black woman, something I never thought of. I was always Sandra, you know, I'm, I'm Sandra, I'm Congolese and that's it. But then I started to really identify as a black person because I realized that blackness everywhere is feared it is painted as evil. Um, and America, like that's a, a lesson that I learned from America, some, a place that, you know, both diversity and acceptance and the melting pot. And I came to learn that it was probably one of the most divided places on earth. Um, and it, it was disheartening, but I also felt this very deep, deep sense of belonging to the black community. Um, and not because I think that there aren't any like issues to be worked on, on between like black, black Americans and African, like African natives like me that live in America, but because like at the heart of it all, we are, when we walk outside the door, no one sees Africans want to see African American, they just see a black person and they treat you accordingly. And so I, you know, I am a proud black woman. I consider myself a black American. Um, and I strive to really tell our stories and, and to show people how the black experience here and black experience globally is similar. It's the same. Uh, our blackness has always been used as a weapon. And to to read to read articles calling African Americans like savages or thugs or it 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 was kind of re traumatizing. It was re traumatizing, honestly, and it still kind of is. It's one of those things that I'm constantly learning, constantly evolving and understanding like what it means to be a black person globally. And and that's something that I wish I was taught at a younger age because right now as an adult, it's just becoming overwhelming to deal with. Um, yeah. I know I just went all over the place with that question, but um, yeah, I can I can really talk circles in, in, in the discussion because I feel like it's so complex and, and it's one that I'm still learning. Like I'm still living that experience and under, I'm really truly understanding um, what that means and what kind of similarities that I can draw between the two, the cultures that I've lived in as a black person. Thank you so much for such a comprehensive and insightful response, uh, Sandra. I'm sure we all benefited on uh, multiple ways from learning about uh, uh, your experiences, your thoughts and reflections and uh, 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 these are matters that I think are uh, um, very, very uh, close to us today, and we're thinking about this a lot. So it was uh, very, very 
uh, good uh, uh, and kind of you to share so much insight and, and reflection with us. Thank you. Um, we are getting close to, uh, to, to, to the end of our event, but I have one more question for you, Sandra. And uh, this is, you know, <clears throat> see, most books are not written just to be written or even just to be read, right? We don't just put down a book and sort of forget everything, right? Books are written to inspire and to also make changes in the world. And your book does exactly that. Your book is a call to action, a call to reflection. Can you tell us a little bit about what kinds of things we here in the US can do? What kinds of actions can we take to change the world and make it a better place for folks who are suffering and, and uh, experiencing the kinds of things that uh, many refugees today do. And sadly in the world today, the number of people who are displaced through war and conflict, uh, environmental uh, uh, degradation, climate change, et cetera, is just growing and increasing. So what kinds of actions might you suggest we, we undertake uh, uh, in order to kind of do our little part? Um, yeah. Because after all, we all belong to the same planet, right? We have to work together like as if we belong in this planet. So what might you recommend for us to do that we can take away from your talk today and go home and say, you know, it's not, you know, it, it's, I'm not uh, 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 someone who, who, who's like, you know, incapable of doing it. I can also do something small. So if you can give us yes. your suggestions and reflections, that would be great. Yeah, first and foremost, I, I like to encourage people to look into their communities first before you start looking what you can do abroad, what you can do to help nonprofits working in countries like my, my own, but to really look at in your local community. What about my story um, resonates with you? Because chances are there are hundreds of refugees right in your city that have the same exact story or a similar story. They're living these very same things that I'm talking about and have no outlet. And so I encourage people to always do the local research and, and to get to know your refugee community, your refugee and immigrant community. Um, because something so simple to you, like an after school tutoring session where you help somebody learn English or just helping them run an errand, that's something that seems so simple and so basic, but is actually so powerful because it's not just that act of helping someone run their errand, it's that friendship. It's somebody feeling like, wow, this person cares that I'm here. They, they actually see me. I'm a person to them. I'm not just this statistic or this burden on their local economy. Um, so those things I think are so powerful in one, helping people integrate, but to also form this like unity between the locals and the people that are coming in seeking refuge. Um, I like to say that it's really not enough to say that we accept refugees in this country. It's also about how we treat them once we're, they're in this country. Because how good or how well do you improve someone's life um, by bringing them here? if you're not also helping them integrate, if you're not helping them become their best version of themselves in this country, helping them achieve their potential and unlock their potential in this country, um, which is something we tend to completely disregard. We bring refugees here and after six months we say, well, good luck, I hope you find your own way. And there's so many systems that we do not understand. Till this day, I cannot tell you that my parents understand how to work FAFSA. I don't think anyone does, but the point is, I don't think that like my parents understand those kinds of things. I don't think my parents understand a lot of systems that seem very basic, uh, but are actually pretty complex to us having heard them for the first time. And so doing things like that can actually be so powerful in somebody's life. Um, the second thing I would like to shamelessly plug my nonprofit, Jimbera Fund. Uh, we work with women in Congo and help them to, yeah, <laughs> mobilize women uh, to start their own businesses and, you know, contribute as a part of their economy, which is something that they've been left out of since forever. Um, women in Congo have been the backbone of Congo 
in many times actually bearing the brunt of the wars and being the most of the victims of the wars, but also not having anyone invest in in their livelihoods. Um, and we are very proud Congolese people working on Congolese issues. We believe that we know exactly what our country needs, what our, our country women need. Um, and so far, we've done a lot of great things. We've um, helped women start milling machine businesses. We try to think of businesses that are helpful to the entire community, not just to the individual. So like milling machines and helping women get connected to larger markets where they can sell their crops and be able to compete with other merchants. That's something that we are really so proud of, of just being, being Congolese people doing it. That's something that I've always been really upset about seeing outsiders come into Congo and claim to know everything. They didn't even ask us what we wanted. They just said, well, here you go. This is, you know, this is our kind of prescription to your problems and, and it can help you. But what we do is really go in. We already, we work in a community that I'm from. Like it's where my grandparents live to this day. Um, and, and so knowing that community that intimately, but also going back in, since I've been gone for a while, but going back in and, and kind of figuring out what people's needs are, where we can be the most useful. Um, but basically what we do is just support women to start businesses in their communities. They're small businesses to you, um, but to them, it means being able to put food on the table for their children, being able to put the, the kid that couldn't afford to go to school in school, being able to buy them um, backpacks and notebooks, very, very basic things that we take for granted um, and that they would like to provide for themselves. And so we give them an opportunity to, to kind of build that themselves and just be there to support them. And another, so please support the Fund if you can uh, and want to. Um, and another organization that I would like to highlight is Refuge Point. Refuge Point works with displaced people all over the world, but especially in Africa and here in America. They are stationed in what I'd like to call, um, we like to call transit countries. And transit countries are the countries that the refugees end up in before they're resettled. So a lot of refugees will go through neighboring countries looking for refuge and they register with UNSCR and then hope to be resettled to a country like the US or Canada or someplace in Europe. Um, but the reality is only a small, small percentage of those people get resettled, especially in this current climate in the US. The US used to accept over 84,000 refugees a year in 2016. Today, there's less than 10,000 people being admitted into the US every day. And so there leaves a large number of people sitting in, in this limbo with nothing to do, with no resources, and simply relying on what they can get from their relatives or loved ones. And so what Refuge Point does is create self-reliance programs in those countries to help refugees that are waiting with settlements to be able to provide some for themselves. And that takes away from the animosity that they face from the natives who feel like, well, these refugees are coming in and taking resources and we're also hungry. Uh, but when a, a, an organization like Refuge Point comes in and provides some resources and assistance to, to displaced people, it really, really goes a long way into integrating them in the communities that they're probably going to be living in for the foreseeable future. Refuge Point, I love this organization so much because one, they really, really care about the people that they work with and they make sure to make a, to represent them in, in what they do here. And I'm part of the board at uh, uh, Refuge Point um, and they welcome, they, they have another refugee, former refugee on the board as well. And it's one of those organizations whose leaders are really committed 
to making sure they're serving people with, with dignity. Uh, and that's something that I always look for when supporting a nonprofit is how are you presenting these people? Are you presenting them as this like charity case that as U.S. people need to help? Or are you presenting them as people who are perfectly capable of build, building their own lives that just need a little assistance? Because that's what most refugees are. Um, my mother only attended school up until the fifth grade, but she owned multiple businesses when I was younger. And that's something she wouldn't have been able to do had she not had the assistance uh, of people giving her the seed funding to kind of start those businesses. Uh, and that's something that is very practical that we can do to change the lives of people that are living in, in this limbo. But they also work in resettling people here, Refuge Point is very active with the State Department uh, and the UNHCR in recommending people that deserve to be resettled, people that are in extreme either danger or really need resettlement based on like health or um, just special circumstances. And they are really, really hands-on. They work. Um, they work mainly in Nairobi. That's their biggest office and they have locals working and going into these communities and vetting people. They have counselors. It's really such a well-rounded organization um, that I would love all of you to visit and support. They're based in Boston. Um, and yeah, those are great. They're doing great work. And those are the two organizations that I would love for you all to support uh, and to learn more about. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions regarding them or if you'd like to be connected to those to be connected to those organizations in any way but um they're doing absolutely amazing work and i realize i say that being a part of those organizations but i really believe it yeah. so um we're we're actually out of time but sandra i was wondering if you'd be willing to answer a question or two um and, and I, I'll, I'll create a kind of composite from all questions that we've gotten from, from the chat. Um, and those are mostly about home. And um, so someone asks um, where, where you consider home and what makes that feel like home to you. And also questions about comparing your, your sense of home and environment in Africa to the US. So if you can kind of think about home and environment mm -hmm. and yeah, see, that's one of those like identity crises that I'm still having even as an adult. Like, I think of Congo as my home. Like, even after all these years, I still think of it as that home. But at the same time, I spent most of my adolescent years in um, Rochester, New York. And that's home too, because I now have roots there that I feel like would be destabilizing to lose. Uh, a lot of the friends that I made, the schools that I attended, all things that are so much, so much a part of me now that I, you know, that that's what makes home. So that's also my home. Um, of course, like my first home is always going to feel like somehow it's more, more so home than my second home. Um, but I think the older I get, the more I realize that I don't have to pick, I don't have to pick a side. They're both my homes. They've both contributed so much to the woman that I am today. And I'm sure to the woman that I will become um, that they're both home. Um, what makes it home? I'm, I'm not sure. I think it's the people, the people that are, that are there and what they mean to me. And I have, people that mean so much to me in Congo still, family members, childhood friends, but I also have friends that I made as a teenager, fam people that are not considered my family, that are not a part of my family, that live in Rochester, New York, and all over America. Um, and I don't think I would ever be able to just walk away from Rochester, New York, and, and never consider it my home because it's, it's shaped me so much. 
Um, and I've been very fortunate and lucky to have the people that have been placed in my life uh, that have helped me to get to where I am today. And I can't overlook that. And that's, that's family. That's what, that's what home is. And, and I'm, I feel fortunate to have two homes. Thank you. And so I'll put one final composite question for you. Um, and that is about whether you've seen the TV show Black Earth Rising, um, which is about the um, Rwandan genocide in the International Criminal Court at the UN. Um, and another person asks if um, um, what what the what the best way of getting into contact with you in the future is, and I will oh, read the email address you just sent. Yeah, I, I just sent it, but I I, I sent it privately. I'm sorry. But yes, I, uh, feel free to share my email with anyone that wants to get in contact with me. I, you know, as much as I am an author and speaker at the core of it, I'm still an activist. I'm still someone that uh, has a mission. And that mission is to raise awareness to what's happening in Congo, but also what's happening here and how it's all connected. And so I'd love people reaching out to me if you have any ideas or anything that you want to be involved in that you think I can help. I'm more than happy to assist. Um, what was your other question, I'm sorry? About the TV show Black Earth Rising, which is about the International Criminal Court having to do with the Rwandan Oh my gosh, so I started watching that show and it was just too much for me. Uh, there's just some things that I, they're still too fresh, even after all these years, that feel too real to me. Um, I just saw this movie on Netflix recently. It's a horror film it's called His, His House. And it's about these, this refugee couple um, being resettled in Europe and their house is haunted and you know, they're, they're kind of stuck. And it really kind of felt in a way, like of course, you know, my house wasn't haunted and it wasn't that creepy, but it, the same sentiment of like, fleeing such atrocious and horrible things and then getting to your to this country that's supposed to now be your home and it's haunted and you're scared and you you have you're confused you don't know what's going on I it was it was a lot like I finished watching it and I remember I was like oh my gosh like maybe I shouldn't have seen this at night time because it may like um cause me to have like night terrors or something like that because those, it's so real. Like these issues are, are very real to some people. And even the genocide, the Raman genocide, um, it's, it's spilled over into Congo and into the conflicts that are happening in Congo today. So those are all things that like impact me so deeply that sometimes seeing them in, in like film is really, uh, is really hard for me. So I have not finished Black Earth Rising because of that, because I, I just, um, you know, I'm still healing from a lot of things. And, and, and sometimes exposure can just be re-traumatizing. So I have not. Thank you so much, Sandra. Thank you for your time. And thank you for uh, sharing with us so much. Uh, and for everybody here who, who is still here, uh, thank you for staying beyond the seven o'clock point and for uh, uh, spending more time here. Uh, <clears throat> let's uh, take uh, all of the lessons, uh, um, that especially the most important ones I feel that I, I at least learned. One is to look around us, look close to us, where the lives and worlds of people who are displaced and who are struggling to put their lives back together can not only draw us to feel sympathetic or empathetic, but also to inspire our solidarities with them. So we can help and realize this, this truism. We tell each other all the time, right? We live on the same planet. We're all human beings. But to make that actual, right? Thank you so much for sharing uh, uh, your insights and thoughts, Sandra. And uh, please, everybody, if you have not, uh, gotten yourself a copy of this book, please do this, How Dare the Sunrise by Sandra Oviringi Amana, a wonderful book, uh, very uh, highly praised by many reviews, uh, reviewers. And if you need any more information, 
uh, as uh, 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 you've seen in the chat, you can contact uh, uh, Sandra by email. Also, uh, also contact uh, uh, Amanda in the, uh, I House, the International House here at uh, UTK, and uh, look forward to more programs and more such events in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, if if uh, uh, Dr. Shirinyan or uh, uh, if Amanda, if you want to say anything more, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Sandra, for being here and for speaking with us. This has been really wonderful. Oh, thank you. I, I truly love conversations like this. And I know it's not the same as being in person with one another, but I really appreciate you guys hosting this event still and, and having me here and being able to share um, some of my experiences, which are hundreds of thousands of people's experiences worldwide. Truly, it means so much to me. And, and thank you, and thank you to everyone that came. I wish I could have seen all of your lovely faces, um, but maybe someday in the future. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you again, Sandra, and thank you all for attending. If you're interested in more events like this, we have International Education Week going on the rest of this week, um, and the iHouse also puts on events like this throughout the academic year, so please stay in touch with us, and like Sandra said, hopefully one day we can get her on campus and we can all meet in person. But enjoy your night, and thank you so much. And Tennessee doesn't get that cold, Sandra, so, you know. <laughs> it doesn't. I was there this summer, and I was